Well, welcome everyone. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, an introduction to positron emission tomography. And because this is an, um, we're at an imaging center, I'm going to start with the actual images. Uh, and what you can see here is a PET image on the left and an MR image of the brain on the right. And you've all already learned in the seminar series about uh, MRI. And you can just see that PET looks very different from MRI. Um, PET is known for having exceptional sensitivity and specificity. And uh, this is true for a wide range of biological processes. And it's a quantitative technique. However, it has some limitations. Uh, for example, it has lesser spatial resolution compared to MR and has limited anatomical information depending on what kind of radio tracer you use. MR, on the other hand, as you all know, has excellent soft tissue contrast um, and can look at high resolution anatomy. It also has a good temporal resolution compared to PET. And however, it has a relatively poor sensitivity for molecular processes. And so today we'll explore a little bit of why that's the case and how the um, PET images are generated and why they look um, with what they look like. Yes? Sorry, are these the same actual slices? These are not exactly the same. No, they're not the same patient, in fact. Um, maybe in the future we can change that. But they're not exactly the same. They're, they're approximately the same. So what is PET? In PET, we're looking at positrons. Positrons are um, an anti-electron, really that means it has the same charge as an electron, but uh, a positive charge instead of a negative, negative charge. Uh, we're looking at emission, which means that the radioactivity is emitted from an unstable nucleus inside a subject. And all of this is recorded with tomography, which comes from the Greek word tomos, which means slice or section, and graphy, um, uh, or graphia from the Greek word means writing and it really refers to a general imaging uh, acquisition that uses any kind of penetrating waves to get sections of the subject you're looking at. So the positron emission part uh, means that we're starting out with a radionuclide so this um, this means that we're looking at the reaction of an unstable parent nucleus. This uh, unstable parent nucleus has a proton that decays to a neutron in the nucleus, which means that uh, a neutrino is emitted as well as a positron. This positron travels for a small distance, which is called the positron range. And once it's traveled the distance and it meets with an electron, uh, it combines with the electron in an annihilation reaction. This reaction gives rise to two um, 511 keV photons that are emitted approximately at an angle of 180 degrees. And it's exactly this reaction that we're measuring in PET. Because what we do in, uh, uh, in positron emission tomography is that we're injecting a radio tracer that contains this radioactive isotope and we inject this intravenously into the bloodstream of a subject. That means the trace accumulates in the body and uh, wherever it accumulates, it has this reaction where we can then measure two photons uh, given away at a 180 degree angle and we measure this with a 3D ring of PET detectors using coincidence detection. And I just want to put this into perspective because we're looking in, at PET, uh, in PET we're looking at very high energies. We're looking at 511 keV photons which is all the uh, way on the right end of the spectrum so we're looking at gamma rays which have a very high frequency and this means that the photons can penetrate through the tissue and we can detect them uh, with the tomography and we'll talk a little bit more about why they're not completely penetrant. Uh, but we'll get to that later. And compared to this, we're looking at visible light on the order um, of 0.4 to 0.7 micrometers. And MRI is on the complete left-hand side of the spectrum, uh, where we're looking at uh, radio frequency 
waves with uh, a relatively uh, long wavelength. And what I want to do in this talk today is really to go step by step of all the elements that we need to, uh, to do a successful PET scan and look at the data. So we'll start out uh, with the cyclotron, so the radioisotope production and the radio tracer itself, uh, which is then injected in a subject and we're acquiring PET images. Then images need to be reconstructed. From this, we usually extract some region of interest data and we're looking at uh, um, time, so called time activity curves, which we can then model with a compartmental model in order to get our outcome parameters, uh, which are quantitative and can um, relate to biological mechanisms such as recept receptor occupancy or glucose metabolism, for example. And I also have a few quizzes for you throughout the presentation. So um, let's see what you recall from what we've already talked about. In PET, a blank is injected intravenously. Any ideas? Yeah, I hear something. Don't be shy. A radioactive tracer. The unstable radionuclide emits a positron. Great. When the positron combines with an electron, this is called annihilation. Perfect. You are paying attention. <laughs> the annihilation gives rise to two blank at a 180 degree angle. I think I heard photons. Two 511 kV photons. Very good. And then a ring of PET detectors measures the pairs of photons using It's a little harder, but it's coincidence detection. All right, great. Let's move on. So um, I'm going to start out with uh, cyclotron and uh, radio tracers themselves. So in PET, for each PET imaging study, we need to produce uh, radio isotopes and the radio tracer on the day of the scan because the half-lives of the PET isotopes that we're looking at are relatively short. And there are some example half-lives here. So carbon-11 has a half-life roughly of 20 minutes and fluorine-18 um, of 110 minutes, so almost two hours. And there's even shorter half-lives. But carbon-11 and F-18 are really um, probably the most widely used PET isotopes. And so what happens is that you know a, a few hours before your actual PET scan, um, your radiochemist will produce your radio tracer. And this is done using a cyclotron. In this, uh, you're bombarding a, um, an atom with a proton beam in order, to, uh, in order to have a reaction that produces your radio isotope, which is an unstable uh, uh, nucleus. This is done um, in, the, um, uh, in the cyclotron and can then produce your, um, your form, your isotope from, C, um, uh, from nitrogen going to carbon-11. As a second step, once you have produced your radioisotope, you're now running on a clock. So you have to imagine if you're looking at C11, you have 20 minutes of a half-life. So each 20 minutes you lose, you're losing half your activity. So now you've got to be fast because you still have to take that isotope and attach it to a biomolecule. And this is done using a number of steps from chemistry, um, using purification and formulation. Um, and it has to be a sterile formulation in the end to be able to be injectable into a patient. And you can choose what molecule to label with, and we'll get into that in a, in a little bit. But then finally, that's the end of the production, then you would take a given amount of radioactivity from the production and inject it into your uh, subject from which we can then acquire the images. And there's a couple important uh, definitions here. So the units of radioactivity uh, are in Becquerel. This is the SI unit 
And that really means that one becquerel means that we have one decay per second. In the US, we generally use uh, the, the uh, unit of curie or millicuries generally. And it's a simple linear conversion where one nanocurie is equal to 37 becquerel, but they're equivalent. And I've already mentioned this, but I really want to point out that radioactive uh, decay means that uh, time is of the essence in PET imaging. If you take your two most common isotopes, F18 or C11, you can see that the decay curves which follow an exponential decay are very different because F18 has a longer half-life, almost two hours, and C11 has uh, a half-life of 20 minutes. And I've talked a lot about half-life, but really half-life means that it's the time it takes for half the atoms to decay. So if you have a short half-life, you have a less stable nucleotide, and, um, and it's dependent on that time of how quickly you generally need to react in your scan. So um, as an exact example, if you, have your, uh, if you have your PET scan and, uh, lined up and suddenly your subject is 20 minutes late, suddenly you might lose half of your radioactivity before you're injecting. Um, so in PET, the timing is really essential to be coordinated with the radio tracer production. So when you have your isotope, that's uh, half the job because really the question is what target do you want to image in the human body? And there's many, many different targets in PET which makes it so powerful. And people generally think about radio tracers and which radio tracer to pick, but Perhaps a, a better way to think about it is to think about what do you want to see in uh, your PET study. And that's when you need to think about the biological target that you want to um, uh, image. And I would say there's two main categories of PET tracers. One of them uh, is a PET tracer that's receptor or ligand based. So it means that the, uh, mm, that the molecule binds to a given receptor in the brain and is then the, the, um, the, your uh, image is then proportional to generally the concentration of that uh, receptor uh, density. Uh, on the other hand, you have general molecules that um, are part of an enzyme or substrate-based reaction where, where sometimes it, uh, it is infused into the bloodstream but then undergoes a reaction and we measure the site of that reaction. And one of the most famous examples here is FDG or fluorodeoxyglucose, which looks at glucose metabolism. And FDG uh, is really PET if you look at the clinical world. Um, FDG is used uh, everywhere in the clinic and its main purpose is to use uh, to look at um, uh, for, for oncology and in cancer imaging because the uptake is very high in a tumor. However, that's not the, the perhaps the most interesting um, or, or the most um, uh, widely used target in research. Um, but I guess I have, uh, I have an example of glucose utilization. So there's, apart from uh, cancer imaging, you can also use glucose as a surrogate for metabolism in general, including metabolism of the brain, uh, which we often do with fMRI. And you know that your brain represents only 2% of your body weight, but it does receive 15% of your cardiac output, 20% of total uh, body oxygen, and a 25% total of the um, glucose utilization. And that's really the reaction we're looking at when we're looking at um, FDG, because FDG um, gets broken down, don't worry about the, the structures here, but FDG gets broken down by the same enzyme as uh, glucose gets bro broken down, and after that step it gets metabolically trapped. So we can look at the concentration of glucose being broken down. And you can do this in, um, in this flagship paper by Fox et al. Um, it was done in a, a visual stimulation of a resting brain versus a um, 
now visual activation, and you can see that in the occipital cortex, there's a um, accumulation of glucose, and that's really the base of fMRI of what we do today, where we're now looking at uh, hemodynamic changes, but perhaps the first functional imaging studies were done with glucose or FDG. So apart from FDG, uh, there's uh, a whole lot of targets that look at receptor binding and receptors especially in the brain. And there's a couple of concepts that are important. And the idea is really that um, you have a radio tracer concept first. So that means that you're injecting a very small amount, you're injecting a tracer amount, that's why we call it radio tracer. So there's a very small amount that you inject and you assume that it doesn't disturb the biological system. So if you're looking at a high density target, uh, you're expecting your radio tracer to bind proportionally to the density of the target, but to not overall change it. So we, we assume that you know, in, in total there's less than 5% um, of your receptors being bound by the tracer. But still it's proportional to it because if you're looking at the low density target, um, you expect less radio uh, tracer to bind to that area. However, there's a little bit of a caveat if you're looking at in vivo imaging, which is what we're doing in PET, because in the brain we also have endogenous ligands, so we have neurotransmitters that are naturally there, and they can uh, block or um, stay at a target. So if you take the upper image where you have um, some unknown endogenous ligand being bound at that target, and you compare that to a low density target, what PET is seeing is that the high density and low density target here actually gives you the same signal because the number of available receptors for PET to see is the same. And that's important to remember because in PET we're not directly looking at the density, we're always looking at the number of available receptors. And in general, we can uh, understand a little bit more when we do modeling of our tracers and the time courses of the tracers. And this really combines information from pharmacokinetics, which is uh, the area where we can learn uh, information about a drug and um, how it distributes itself in the body. But also we can see uh, what happens to the um, body due to the drug, which is uh, the area of pharmacodynamics. And it's this combined information that we really get out of PET. The uptake part is a portion of pharmacokinetics and the downslope gives you um, uh, an, an information about the pharmacodynamics um, of your injected substance. And radio traces are unique because they exhibit so-called saturable binding, which means that they uh, they can be blocked, if you're giving a blocking dose, they will at some point saturate and there, there's not an infinite amount of the radio tracer that can accumulate because you're assuming it hits a specific target that is there and can't, uh, and, and doesn't have an infinite pool um, to, to be uh, dissolved in. And I'm going to go just through a couple of uh, examples of radio tracer. So for example, uh, in the dopamine system alone, we can image uh, more than five or six different targets, as you can see here. One of them is, of course, the dopamine receptor itself. There's the 11 raclopride for that. But we can also look at dopamine transporters uh, with the DAT imaging ligand. Uh, and, of course, we can look at glucose metas metabolism, uh, which also occurs at every synapse. But we can also look at and cinematic reactions such as monoamine oxidase A, which breaks down dopamine into its um, uh, um, counterparts. And I've already mentioned C11 raclopride, but C11 raclopride is really one of the most widely used tracers for looking at the D2 and D3 system. It's been very well characterized in general. And you can look at changes, for example, in this paper at looking at um, antipsychotic D2 occupancy and see how that changes with working memory in healthy um, controls versus patients. 
Another example of a receptor ligand is uh, C11-carfentanil. Um, that's a tracer that targets the mu opioid receptors. Obviously, mu opioid receptors are um, very well known for their substance abuse uh, properties. And a lot of things in relationship to that in alcoholism um, have been studied, but also um, they are important in other diseases such as epilepsy um, or uh, carcinomas. Now, um, amyloid is, um, is a protein in the brain that accumulates, um, in, especially in Alzheimer's disease. And so there's a compound that's been um, out relatively recently, um, which is called C11-PIB. And it's been shown really to show um, very large differences between healthy persons and um, uh, Alzheimer's disease patients. So that's an example of a protein-specific um, uh, radio tracer. And as I said, I'm only giving a few examples, but what you can do is you can go to the NIMH website, and they have a list of all the radio tracers that are uh, targets in the brain. Specifically, currently, I just checked uh, uh, earlier today, and there are 39 brain targets that are listed. That means that there's actually more than 100 molecules because for each target, sometimes you have several radio traces which have different uh, properties. But you can look, go in, uh, on the website and uh, look at this table and see if there's some interest uh, for your study of, of what's uh, been used. And I believe also the Martinez website has um, uh, a list of radio traces which we already have in place here. Um, and there's always discussions about adding more of those. That brings us to our second quiz. Radioisotopes are produced by a cyclotron. Very good. Units of radioactivity are two options. Yes, becquerel or millicurie. Radio tracers are most commonly labeled with, I heard carbon. And fluoride, yes, C11 or F18. The time it takes for 12 millicuries of F18 to decay to 6 millicuries is called the half life. And what's the half life of F18? Two hours. Very good. Ah, it's, it's a little bit um, powered here. I think it's the Mac to PC conversion. <laughs> So, F18, FDG can measure what kind of metabolism? Glucose. Very good. You're paying attention. You're great. Um, all right. So, let me move on to actually the image acquisition, the trace injection, and the scanning procedure. And for that, I have a little uh, video for you. Uh, all right. This is going to stop. All right. So it's just an overview of what's happening for the PET scan. So you've already seen the radio tracer being ejected. Often then you wait. That's very common. That's not true for all radio tracers. But. Um, to say is that at the end you have the 511 kV um, photon detection and suddenly the image magically appears on the computer 
Well, there's a few steps that are involved in getting to that part, and that's what I'm going to talk about now. So, um, I also want to point out we've talked a lot about the half-life, and of course, once you inject your radio tracer into the patient, that uh, decay still occurs. What that means is that towards the end of your scan, your noise is going to increase uh, by a lot more uh, than at the beginning of the scan. And so this is probably how a time course of your pet images and your pet frames will look like if you look at the raw data of your, uh, of your scan. And uh, noise is really increased um, with both a low dose of a radio trace injection um, and as, uh, as time uh, goes on. So it's just uh, important to be aware of that when you're doing images. And in the detection of the PET, there's, um, a, we can classify the types of events that occur into three different types. So one of them are true coincidences, which is what we've always um, uh, talked about since the beginning of this talk, um, where both annihilation photons uh, escape from the body and are detected by the detectors. Now that doesn't always happen um, as perfectly as this because the photons can be attenuated in the body. What that means that is that you can have random coincidences. That's an example where two photons uh, from separate emissions strike the detector and it's detected as actually a false a coincidence pair. The detector thinks that uh, these two photons belong together, but they actually don't because um, one part of the other has been attenuated. And then there's uh, scatter coincidences where one or both of the photons are deflected because of interactions with the matter, um, interactions with the, the body of your subject. And now the line of response that you're looking at from the two photons is not your true line of response. And we need to do um, corrections for these types of events uh, because in general scatter and randoms lead to an increase in your image noise. So here you can see an example of a cylinder with uh, uniform activity that was scanned in a PET image and on the left hand side um, there's been no correction applied. Uh, whereas on the right hand side we've uh, corrected for attenuation. You can see that there's really a ring, a dark ring um, on the outside of that cylinder where we get a lot more photon counts um, as compared to the center. And that's because uh, the attenuation of your photon depends on where it originates uh, inside of the subject. If it lies deeper uh, it, 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 the probability of it attenuating is much higher. And you can express that uh, mathematically, but uh, really for a given photon energy, the attenuation depends on two uh, main things, which is the total distance traveled in that object, and uh, then the attenuation coefficient, which really depends on the atomic weight of the material and really has to do with the uh, with the weight of the material itself. So, um, uh, so for example, uh, tissue is much easier penetrated compared to a metal uh, box, for example. And we can use attenuation corrections uh, by directly applying uh, these two quantities in to correct your image, and that's being done during image reconstruction. There's a number of other corrections uh, that have to be done in PET, and I'm not going to go into detail um, because it would be a little bit beyond the scope, but there's uh, things like normalization where we do quality controls uh, generally every day, but, but a, a large stability scan um, uh, every few months on the scanner that's taken into account in the reconstruction. There's um, pile-up, there's dead time uh, um, corrections that you need to take into account, and you can also get partial volume effects in PET just like an MR, but the uh, physical principles are a little bit different from that. So now I want to give you a little bit of an overview of the um, reconstruction process for when you've acquired your data, uh, how does it look like and what, how do we do the reconstruction? So if you have your subject 
and you have a uh, line of response where your two photons were detected. And we're just assuming these are all the true um, coincidences. For each line of response and um, a given angle, you get one point in a space that's called the sinogram. The sinogram is your raw data space in PET. And it's really a plot of angle versus radius. So for a different line, but the, uh, uh, but the same angle, you're getting a different point in your sinogram. So for all lines of response at that same angle, you're getting one line in your sinogram. And then for a different angle, you're getting a different line in your sinogram. And you can go through that, taking all the projections uh, in that um, and all the counts from that 3D uh, tomography scan. And that's how your sinogram uh, might look like. So how do we then do an image reconstruction from this uh, raw data space? Well, one of the more traditional methods is to use uh, uh, filtered BRAC projection, just like in CT, really. And a simple example of filtered BRAC projection is shown here, where you have um, just an object in your space. And what you would have and have acquired are these projections um, at different angles from that space. So if you take those and BRAC project them in your image space, you're getting um, something that looks like this with a few blocks um, from one angle. And then you would repeat that for all uh, different angles until you can actually somewhat reconstruct your image. And it's this algorithm where when you look at some uh, pet images where you see some hairs on the outside, that's because of the filtered back projection algorithm because it's smudges out the image in that way. What, you, um, what we do here and what's nowadays done more, uh, more often is to use an iterative reconstruction process. That's where you uh, use your sinogram and you estimate an initial image space. You then uh, project that image um, and compare it uh, with a measured, with a measured, uh, an estimate is compared with, with a measured projection. It's compared, there's an error prediction being done, and then uh, that is used in order to re reconstruct the image um, going in an interactive fashion. And um, that's what we use here for the scanners that we have here, um, and it's uh, generally done until the, um, the image converges. And that brings us to our um, third quiz. So the events detected in PET can be classified into three main events. Do you remember some of them? It was a while back. It was the first slide I showed, so it's, it's, um, it's a while. So there's some true events, there are random events, and there are scatter events. And they're all detected by the a pet camera, but it doesn't mean that all of them are true events. The attenuation of photons traveling within an object depends on the distance. yes distance. And what's the second part? Tissue property. I hear something about tissue. Um, the attenuation coefficient, which is the property of the uh, material or tissue that you're in. The raw uh, image data in PET is stored in a sinogram, I hear it. <laughs> Each blank in the sinogram corresponds to coincidences observed for one angle and one radius. Each point. <laughs> almost, almost. That's a difficult one. Okay. Image reconstruction can be achieved by two different methods. Yes, I, I think I heard all of this. So filter back projection or an iterative reconstruction algorithm. All right, and that brings us to uh, us having now, yes, there's a question. <laughs> 
for the for the initial estimate. So I think you actually use a back projection from your sinogram space first as an initial estimate, um, and then compare it to the previous estimate at each time you go around the estimation with the iteration. So the last part I'll be talking about is the um, uh, kinetic modeling and how we can quantify pet data. So this really happens is once you have your pet image and reconstruct it, you can look and uh, understand what is really the biological information we have from that. And uh, that really assumes now that you're acquiring dynamic pet data. Um, there's two types of scans so that you can acquire. So one is really a static pet image where you get just one uh, image out of, and you can look at the distribution of your tracer. But you can look at um, really the uptake and the washout of the tracer if you acquire um, uh, in a pet image, which is generally on the order of uh, 90 minutes or uh, two hours. And you can track how the tracer is being taken up and washed out of the body. And that's what we're looking at now. So if you're taking and looking at uh, what happens in one voxel of your pet image, uh, you could maybe uh, break it down into a couple of things. So if you have a, a radio tracer that binds to a receptor, you assume that the concentration you're seeing is the, uh, the radio ligand bound to that specific receptor. However, that's not only what we are seeing because we're, there will also be some radio tracer that is in the surrounding tissue that will contribute to your pet image. And there's also sometimes tracer that is in the bloodstream because you inject it intravenously that will again also uh, have an impact on your pet image. So what you can then do in the modeling case is that you can take these uh, three different spaces and put them into compartments. And that's what we do uh, when we talk about kinetic modeling. We are using a compartmental model that describes the radio tracer in these different compartments. They are not necessarily physically different compartments, but they're functionally different compartments um, uh, of where the radio tracer can be. So one of them is the plasma, um, which is then in exchange with the tissue. And the numbers K1 through K4 here, they are um, rate constants. So they, are, um, they have units of um, inverse time because that's the rate it takes for the radio tracer to uh, pass into the next compartment. So you assume that you inject your tracer into the bloodstream, it passes into free tissue, and then binds to your specific target. And the reverse can obviously happen where it uh, is being washed out through the bloodstream as well. When you have this model, um, uh, you're really looking at time curves that um, roughly look like this, where your pet signal is the entire, is all three compartments together. So the addition of all three compartments is your pet signal. And you want, you're really interested in that uh, specifically bound ligand compartment. But what you can do is you can write down the equation. So this is a model that ha um, that's really a simple first order differential equation. Um, and you can look at these um, and, and solve them. But the important thing is that uh, the known parameters here are your uh, CP, so which is um, an input function. So in PET, you generally would try to have a plasma input function or some kind of a reference region, which is a little bit of a different model, but there's um, different models that can describe different radio traces, really. But you're looking at um, that as one of your input parameters, as well as your PET uh, signal that you have, which is also the summation of the tissue bound uh, parameters in specific regions. And so in the end, what you're solving for are the rate constants. And because you actually have the um, estimates of all the other concentrations, you can solve for these rate constants um, uh, by fitting this kind of model. And so the outcome gives you the solutions for these uh, rate constants. 
But the rate constants is what we call microparameters in PET. They are um, the individual rate constants for these compartments. And because we only have so much information, we have very little um, information from that one time curse. And you saw, um, I think, three or four differential equations. These microparameters cannot always be reliably estimated. So there's a large error bar associated with them. Uh, what we look at outcome variables are um, compound variables that lump uh, two or three of these microparameters together. And those have been shown that can be robustly estimated. And one of them is uh, so-called binding potential. And the other one is um, volume of distribution. Those are just two examples. But that's the outcome parameters we're looking at. And binding potential is really uh, telling you about the specific binding component. And it is defined as the equilibrium ratio of specific binding relative to a reference concentration. So when you look at uh, binding potential, you can't uh, necessarily get exactly the concentration of your radio tracer or, or your receptors in one region, but the concentration relative to a reference that you're using. And this reference uh, can be either, say, your blood, in, it de uh, blood input. It depends what your uh, initial input variables were, but it can be dependent on the blood or it can be dependent on the reference region. Mm, for example, like in, with radio traces such as racropide, we should look at the dopamine system. We use cerebellum as a reference region because it's known that there's uh, a negligible amount of dopamine receptors in that region. And there is uh, different definitions for binding potential depending on what input function you're using. Um, the important part is just that I want to point out is that the changes in binding potential that you see uh, either over the time course or between two studies, um, if you say do um, uh, a baseline study and then some blocking study or a task study, the difference and the relative change in that is what we call receptor occupancy. And you can get that from the measure of binding potential. That's how we would compute that. And that brings me to, I think, my final quiz, which is on kinetic modeling terminology. So what is the CB compartment? What does it stand for? And that's what we really want Oh, I guess it's just a compartment. I was too fast. <laughs> um, what are the K parameters called? Rate constants. Great. What is CP? That's one of your inputs that you're using. Yes, I did hear it. Plasma concentration, or also called arterial input function. That's what you can measure during your PET scan. So for this, to, um, to get this, you need to take additional blood data from your patient. And the CND compartment, I think that that's hard. I might not have uh, talked about this a lot, but it's called the non-displaceable ligand in tissue. It's really the free-floating tracer that's not bound to anything, but is still uh, existing in tissue. And then CB itself is the specifically bound ligand. That's what we really want to understand when we do PET imaging. And finally, that bounding box there, that's everything that's in your tissue. So um, the total tissue concentration would be uh, including those two boxes. And finally, the gray box, or green box, <laughs> Uh, that's what we are measuring with our PET signal. When you look at the time course of a PET signal, you're looking at all of these components. And an example of a macroparameter is... Yes, binding potential. Very good. Um, and what can we calculate from binding potential? Occupancy, exactly. Great. So I just want to point out that there is uh, a number of modeling softwares that exist with, with which you can do kinetic modeling. Um, uh, there's a commercial software that 
uh, we use here also um, called PMOD uh, that can allow you to use different kinds of models and try different kinds of um, uh, uh, inputs from your data. So you input your uh, time activity curves and you can get uh, an image of uh, binding potential, for example. Um, uh, there's a JIP analysis toolkit, which uh, Joe Mandela has developed. Also, it's an in-house software um, that we use also um, uh, quite a lot for more advanced uh, dynamic kinetic modeling. And I guess just to wrap off, um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the combined PEDMR imaging that we have here at the Martinas. Um, what we have here are two scanners. Uh, one is a high-resolution uh, brain PET scanner. This is really a 3T uh, Tim Trio uh, standard MR scanner with a PET insert. That's for brain-only use. And it's actually mainly used for uh, the uh, brain patients that we have here. It's uh, relatively high resolution on the order of two to three millimeters at its best resolution. Uh, and you're truly simultaneously recording uh, with your MR. The other scanner that we have is the Biograph MMR, which is a whole body scanner. And um, again, it can be used for, for whole body or brain imaging. Uh, but I think users generally prefer the brain pet for the brain imaging uh, studies. And in general, we've talked a lot about um, mm, different applications of PET. So this shouldn't be no surprise, but really with PET, we can look at a number of features such as metabolism. We can look at uh, hemodynamics. We can look at blood flow with uh, flow tracers. Um, we can look at protein binding or neuroreceptor concentrations with specific receptor ligands. Uh, and in MR, we have not only um, the high resolution anatomy, but we can look at a number of functional studies um, such as perfusion, diffusion, and uh, functional imaging. And you can think of all the vast combinations uh, between MR and PET that you can actually now do. And uh, being able to acquire these in a multimodal setting uh, can become really powerful if you can get correlations as well as um, uh, validations between measurements and that's kind of what we've started um, to think about um, in addition there's a number of things like uh, uh, that you can do technically um, so you can use the MR for motion correction of the PET image um, that's what we generally do on the scanners here when you acquire uh, your PET data and MR together the MR is being used to motion correct um, the data you can now try to think about having a non-invasive arterial input function based on a high resolution uh, MR image. And there are some areas of the body where, where when we compare PET MR to PET CT, where CT is really suboptimal uh, compared to MR, uh, especially in the skull base, the breast or the pelvis area. And of course, clinically, uh, we also hope that uh, PET MR could minimize radiation exposure. And a particular application, uh, what, what I've been working with and, and also others at the centers are the question of what happens when a drug or neurotransmitter occupies a receptor in the brain. Uh, what can we measure from uh, the functional response? And the idea is really that you have an exogenous drug that binds to specific receptors. And you can um, uh, understand that the PET signal is now decreased if you have competitive binding and you can measure that with your PET signal. At the same time, you can also record uh, your fMRI signal due to that binding and then compare both the PET occupancy as well as fMRI with each other and learn something from that. Um, so there's a, uh, some studies that we've done on that. So we've looked at um, antagonist action at the D2 and D3 um, dopamine receptors using PET and fMRI, um, and also looked at more advanced, um, getting more advanced biological information such as receptor trafficking and understanding how the signals from fMRI and PET relate to that. So there's very cool and interesting uh, things to be done with uh, simultaneous PET and MR. So with that, I'd like to thank you for staying um, so long in this evening. And um, practically speaking,
If you're interested to do PET studies here at the Martinas, um, you definitely want to get in touch with the radiochemistry team uh, that is led by Jacob Hooker, um, as well as the PET instrumentation and reconstruction team um, with Chipper and Kat Katana. And in general, maybe the questions to, to go away with is what kind of targets do you want to image in your study? And be aware that PET-MR is um, significantly more expensive than MR alone. So with that, thank you very much.